All right, then. Uh, I'd also like to add greetings to everyone who's here and, and those who are on GoToMeeting, Facebook Live. I know some of you are under the weather uh, going around. So let's go before the Lord. Father, thank you for the time and place that you've given to us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We do lift up those in our family who are uh, not feeling well physically, perhaps not feeling well emotionally, uh, perhaps not even feeling well spiritually. Uh, Lord, we need your touch. Each of us need your touch, and you know what we need, and so we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us and, and minister to us, each of us according to our need. And also, part of our need is the gift of teaching, that we would understand this passage of Scripture. So we ask that you would please minister to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you'll join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The last time we were in 1 Corinthians, we heard an exhortation to run to win the race and an exhortation to finish well. That was in chapter 9. And then in the first half, or first third perhaps, of chapter 10, we were given an example of not running to win and not finishing well, at least initially. And of course, that is the nation of Israel. So as we move on, uh, this morning we're going to look at the law that is to govern the race to the finish line. So we left off in verse 13. We'll resume in verse 14. It says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a letter of correction. It is a letter of instruction in righteousness. And this is the motive. This is the tone uh, of the letter. It's the love of a father for his children. If we flip back to chapter 4, Paul referred to himself as such to this church that he planted in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. He wrote, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Uh, he has a love of a father for these people. And he's also, the Apostle Paul is also going to be used to write to the church at Ephesus and to the church at Colossia. Uh, these words uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, directed at fathers. Uh, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And in Colossians chapter 3, fathers, provoke not your children, lest they be discouraged. And so that is the heart with which these words are being written. And he is encouraging them to run to win and to finish well. He's exhorted them to not fall short of it, as did Israel. And therefore, straight up, point blank, he's telling the church at Corinth, flee from idolatry. All right, what is idolatry? Idolatry is an inspiration of Satan, basically, in his spiritual war with God for the hearts, the minds, the souls of mankind, male and female, created in the image of God. It is an idol, is anything or even anyone that's shiny and, and glittery, if you will, that appeals to the lust of the flesh and replaces the Lord Jesus Christ as the object of devotion and worship in someone's life, which has the effect of causing that person to stop short of the finish line and not finish well. Uh, therefore, idolatry, quite clearly, is harmful to one's spiritual health. Uh, and so he says, flee. Verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Uh, in Psalm 111 and in Proverbs chapter 9, we're told that the word of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the, that knowledge of the holy is understanding. Uh, and we get a good understanding when we do 
his commandments. When we obey, we understand. We understand him. And the word of God is the beginning of wisdom. Again, consider Israel. Uh, they fell into idolatry. According to the word of God in Hosea chapter 13, it says, Now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud, as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. What happens to the chaff that is blown off the threshing floor? Where does it go? What happens to smoke when it comes out of a chimney? Where does it go? Dissipates into nothingness. That's what happened to Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, both taken into captivity. So, the prophet Hosea concludes uh, his words with who is wise and he shall understand these things prudent and he shall know them for the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them. The ways of the Lord are right, not what is right in our own mind. Uh, now, the church of Corinth here, they have been taught and very well taught the word of God. Not only by the Apostle Paul, but this guy named Apollos. So they have wisdom. Therefore, they're wise. So he's encouraging them, essentially. He says, I, I speak to you as wise men. Judge ye what I say. Uh, he's encouraging them to search the scriptures to see if what he's writing is true. You know, he's said that about the, the Bereans. They were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. He's saying the very same thing now again to the church at Corinth. Uh, and if what he's saying rings true with scripture, uh, well then do it. Obey the word of God. Verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Flee idolatry. Keep your eyes on the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. Run to win the race. Finish well by staying focused on Jesus. And he gave us something to help us. We have short-term memory problems, don't we? All of us. You don't have to be senior to have short-term memory problems. You just got more of them. But we all have issues. We can't remember. Therefore, he gave us something to remember. And he gave it first to his guys. And he said, and as they were eating, this is the last supper, the last meal before he would go to the cross to offer himself as the sacrifice for sin. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we have this I want, we have a, this remembrance called communion. It's, a, it's to be a, a corporate activity, but it's also an individual time to remember. Remember what? Who Jesus is. Remember what he did. He sacrificed himself for our sins. And to remember that by grace, through faith in him and in his acceptable sacrifice, we are one with him and therefore we are one with each other. Communion causes us to remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And it causes us to remember that God commended, demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as we read in the corporate reading in 1 John chapter 4, uh, that this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. And communion also causes us to remember, flipping back to chapter 6, not only who he is, but who we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Lord has given us this thing we call communion, sharing the, the cracker and the juice to remind us of these things. But not only that, to give us an opportunity to reflect on our personal walk in the Spirit with Jesus. You get to take inventory at least once a month. We get a chance to take inventory of our weaknesses and his strengths. We get to remember and, and reflect on his faithfulness to the Father who sent him and to us, the reason the Father sent him. And we get to reflect on our faithfulness to the Father and to him who laid his life down for us. Uh, and it's an opportunity to shore up some things calling upon the name of the Lord for his strength to do that. So by the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are one loaf, one loaf of bread with the bread of life. And I commend you to read John chapter 6 this afternoon. He is the bread of life. We're one with him and we're one with each other. There's one body. It has one head. Jesus is the head. We are the body of Christ. Uh, and that is as Jesus prayed. Before he went to the cross, he prayed to the Father after he poured his heart into those guys and gave much instruction about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. In John 17, Jesus prayed to the Father. And part of the prayer was, not just for those guys, but for us. Starting in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The apostles' doctrine. Uh, that's us. Jesus praying for us. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The love of the Father for his Son is the same love the Father has for us. We are in him, he is in us. We are one. We can't lose sight. The world and the God small g of this world works feverishly to cause us to lose sight of the oneness we have in Jesus Christ. And the word of God here is exhorting us uh, to keep our hearts and our minds focused on Jesus. Verse 18. Behold Israel, consider Israel. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Uh, so this is a reference to uh, the Jews. We have the church, and there are the Jews. This is the not born again of the Spirit of God by grace through faith Jews who are still gathering in the temple in Jerusalem and offering their sacrifices in accordance with the law of Moses. And under the direction of a high priest, 
the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, uh, ministers at the altar, according to the law of Moses, and they also eat of those sacrifices, which was God's way of providing food for the servants in his house because they don't have a land inheritance. And so consider that. But we have a different high priest, right? Our high priest isn't the high priest that was in Jerusalem at that time. Our high priest is the substance of all those shadows of those sacrifices. Those sacrifices pointed to him. They spoke of him. Jesus told the Jews that. Search the scripture as you think you have eternal life, but they are that which speak of me. The entire Levitical sacrificial system speaks of Jesus. He's our high priest. And in Hebrews, uh, well, first in, in Romans, we learn that he fulfilled. He's the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. We don't have to keep the law. It's already been kept. We're in him. But in Hebrews, we also read that he changed the priesthood. From the Levitical priesthood to the order of Melchizedek. He also changed the law. We read in Hebrews chapter 7, he changed the law from, in the the context of the entirety of Scripture, he changed it from the law of Moses to the law of love because love is the fulfillment of the law. And he is the mediator of a better testament. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And of course, it was himself. And now he serves in the true sanctuary. Our high priest serves in the true sanctuary, which is in heaven. The one that was given to Moses as a tabernacle and then built as a temple, that was just a pattern of the true temple, the true sanctuary in heaven where our high priest ministers. And by his sacrifice, he washed us clean from our sins. And when we were made clean, he also made us kings and priests unto his father. And so in the context then of what verse 18 is saying, uh, what as Israel does in unbelief in the temple in Jerusalem, so is the church to do by faith in the temple on earth. And where's the temple on earth? Where's the temple of God on earth? The church. Us. We are the temple. And we partake of the altar of sacrifice, which Jesus is a sacrifice, verses 16 and 17. And we offer spiritual sacrifices. Uh, these, These words, this letter is written to the church at Corinth. Corinth was an extraordinarily idolatrous city. Every corner had a temple to a false god. And so moving on, verse 19, what say I then, that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Now he's he's already written this. He's revisiting it. If we flip back to chapter 8, Chapter 8, starting verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So now in chapter 10, he revisits that very same thing. An idol is nothing. That which is offered to an idol in sacrifice is nothing. And he's saying this to a people, a group of people, who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and are striving to follow him. Uh, But they have loved ones. And they have friends and they have associates that worship idols in these many different temples around town. 
And so Paul is instructing them what to do and what to think in the place where they've been planted. And it starts with the knowledge and the understanding that both idols and the things that are offered to idols are nothing. It's like the smoke coming out of the chimney. It's nothing. It's got a, the idol is a, a false facade for something behind which is a demon we're going to read, and it's empty. There is no hope, there, there's no love, there's nothing in an idol. Uh, and that's because there's only one true living God. One. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So the Gentiles do not know the one true living God, maker of heaven and earth. Why? Well, first of all, they have opted to worship the creation rather than the creator. The the heavens declare the glory of God. All of creation bears witness that there is a creator, uh, but they're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And they don't know, in part, the one true living God because the God, or because, excuse me, because Israel stopped short of their calling. Israel was a nation that God created. He started with one man, then he took one family, and over 400 years and with much affliction, he created a nation. And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, he says to them, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I'm the only God there is. I've revealed me, myself, to you. I've created you for me. You are my witnesses. In in chapter 43, verse 12, I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Why did God create Israel? To reveal himself to them and that through them reveal himself to the nations. He created them to be his witnesses. They fell short. They stopped short. And one of the ramifications of that is the nations, the Gentiles, do not know the one true living God. Now, Paul's already encountered this. Before he came to Corinth, he was at Athens. And he saw all these temples there. Athens may be worse than Corinth in terms of idolatry. And he he saw uh, a temple to the unknown God. And he gathered the, the philosophers there at Mars Hill and said, you people are so superstitious. And at the end of it all, after his witness of the one true living God, He said to them, and the times of this ignorance, not knowing God, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Repent of what? Not believing, of worshiping idols. Behind every one of one is a demon. Every man everywhere should repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. The creator put up with your ignorance, but now you don't have an excuse. Worship Jesus. And here, chapter 20, excuse me, chapter 10, verse 20, behind every idol is a demon, the purpose of which is to draw a person away from the creator, from the true God. And therefore, every offering offered to an idol is offered to a demon. The church at Corinth is different than the rest of the population in Corinth. The church at Corinth is a group of people 
that have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And therefore, Paul is obviously exhorting them, don't fellowship with demons, right? Have fellowship with the Lord, have fellowship with each other. You cannot fellowship with demons and finish well. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You cannot commune. It's impossible. Cannot commune with the Lord who is light and who is life. And at the same time, commune with demons who are trapped in darkness and in death. You cannot eat and drink from the Lord's table and eat and drink from the table of devils. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. What's mammon? Money, material wealth, an idol, behind which is a demon. Verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So Paul's essentially saying, you know, wait a minute, you know, if you're not sure <laughs> this makes any sense, think about it. Uh, can we provoke the Almighty Lord with jealousy, which is a righteous indignation, with our disobedience and our unfaithfulness by indulging ourselves and prosper? Can it go well for us if we do that? Uh, are we stronger than the Almighty? Are we able to contend with him to have our will done instead of his will be done and win? Well, obviously not. And in the flow of things, again, consider Israel. Verse 6 in this chapter. Now these things, this is the history of Israel. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them, Israel, for examples that are written and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Consider Israel. Learn from Israel. And so with the understanding that an idol is nothing and that that which is offered to an idol is nothing. And with the knowledge that behind every idol is a demon. And with the understanding that the followers of Jesus Christ cannot eat and drink at the Lord's table and at the table of devils. What is the church at Corinth supposed to do there in this idolatrous city in which they live? Well, verse 23 all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. And the King James, it says wealth. It's in italics. It's not there. What does it mean? It means well-being. That's context, what's going on here. So fleeing idolatry, backing up all the way to the beginning here, fleeing idolatry, keeping our eyes on the prize, staying focused on Jesus, who washed us clean of our sins, and his, our high priest, uh, knowing that there's only one true living God, and communing with the Lord and not with demons, being diligent, to follow Jesus Christ in the race to the finish line, all things are lawful because Jesus is the end, the completion, the fulfillment of the law of Moses for righteousness for those who believe. Key phrase, for those who believe. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Not all things are to our advantage. 
when it comes to God working in our lives to conform us into the image of his dear son. And that is a work God has started and he's still at it and he's going to be faithful to finish it. Not everything is to our advantage toward that end. Not everything is profitable for us if we're going to run to win and finish well the race. And not everything builds us up in the faith of Christ, in our relationship with him, and in our relationships with each other. But what is lawful is the law that is given to govern our race to the finish line. And that law is don't seek, don't selfishly seek your benefit, your well-being, Rather, selflessly and selflessly seek the benefit, the well-being of others as Christ did for us. The law that governs our race to the finish line is called the royal law. The very first letter written to the entire church was written by the pastor in the church at Jerusalem, James, right? And in James chapter 2, verse 8, he wrote to the entire church, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That's the law that governs our life. That's the law that governs our race to the finish line. And so how does that apply to them and to us We're going to get some examples here, starting in in verse 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, the shambles uh, is not a a dumpster or a a pile of rubbish. Uh, the, The Greek word means butcher shop or meat market. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So, one of the issues that this church was struggling with, do we eat food, meat, that's been sacrificed to idols? Well, in this situation, uh, the Holy Spirit, the the Apostle Paul, is saying whatever meat you buy at the butcher shop, uh, whatever meat you buy in the meat market, eat! And don't go nosing around investigating where it came from so that you have a clean and a clear conscience. Conscience is a a moral guidance. What is the right thing to do? Uh, Don't ask. Just buy it and eat it. Why? Because it belongs to the Lord. He's quoting Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth and the fullness thereof are the Lord's. Next situation is in verse 27. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So here we have a situation where an unbeliever might be a a loved one, family member, friend, associate, whatever. uh, An unbeliever invites you over for dinner. And you want to go. Cool. Go. And eat whatever is set in front of you, graciously accepting the hospitality that's being given to you. And again, don't be asking questions about where it came from so that you have a clear and a clean conscience. Right? And the next situation, the third one, is in verse 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, Eat not for his sake that shoot it, declared so, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What does that mean? All right, so someone is obviously someone is an unbeliever. Someone invites you over for dinner and tells you that the food they're serving you was offered to a demon. And therefore, we're going to give thanks for this meal to an idol. What's the right thing to do? 
don't eat. Why is that the right thing to do? First of all, for his sake. Be a witness of truth. It's an opportunity to witness of the one true living God. For the benefit of that unbeliever, do not eat. Secondly, for the sake of your own conscience, that you would have a clean and a clear conscience. Because the earth and the fullness thereof belong to the Lord. You know that, but your host denies it. And he wants to give thanks to a demon for this food that the Lord has provided. It, the thanks belong exclusively to the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't go. Now, you're probably scratching your head. I'm not sure that's ever happened. You know, I don't know why this applies to us. Well, let me give you a modern day example in these days of Lot. What if you get a wedding invitation to homosexual marriage? Someone you know. Someone maybe you know well. Maybe someone you love. Maybe someone in your own family. Do you go? No. Well, that's not very loving now, is it? Oh, on the contrary. It's very loving. Because to go... The Spirit of God dwelling in you to go says to that person, they're okay with it. God must be okay with it. When nothing could be further from the truth. It's a bad witness. It's a bad witness. It's loving. Doesn't maybe seem like it on the surface, but it's loving to say no and to give a good witness of Jesus Christ. And we've received invitations like that. I don't know if you all have yet, but we have. And the answer is no. And it's not malicious. It's loving. Can't. Me going says God's okay with it. God's not okay with it. He's not angry. He's heartbroken. Verse 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? You know, that that third scenario may be kind of difficult to to understand or to get our heads and our hearts around uh, begs the question, you know, why, why is my freedom, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm a follower in Jesus Christ, why is my freedom impinged by the conscience of someone else? If I eat in that situation, if I go to that homosexual wedding, if I eat Giving, giving grace to the host, thanking him for his hospitality, and giving thanks to the Lord for the food that he's given to me, why am I being evil spoken of? What's the answer? Conscience. The moral guidance. The right thing to do. Is dictated by where the other person is. It's not about me. It's about the other person. Where is that person relative to Jesus Christ? That dictates what I do. The appropriate action for a believer in every situation is determined by the other person. Whatever situation you're facing, what's the right thing to do in this race to the finish line? The royal law. The law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon those two hang all the law and all the prophets. If you keep the royal law, you do well. Law is the fulfilling of the word. In chapter 8 of this book, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 7. 
Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of an idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commended us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. That's the issue. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And though thy, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye, when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Bottom line, the brother. Not me. I'm last. In our flesh, we're first. There's a band called Me First and the Gimme Gimmies. They, uh, they do, um, they make fun of songs or they do them differently. The name is hilarious because that's us in our flesh, right? Me first and the gimme gimmies. We have to be re-educated. No, no, no. The Lord first and foremost in all things and everybody else next. And I'm dead last. That's the law of love. And we stated in chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but not, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. Verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Bottom line. Why the law of love? It's what drew us to the one true living God. Through us, it will draw others. Uh, the law that governs. Our race to the finish line is this law. It's the royal law. The love of God and the love of others is to be the motive for every decision we make, every action we take, every word we speak, because it, whatever the it is, whatever the situation is, uh, it is not about me. It's about Jesus. And it's about that person. Therefore, the exhortation, everything you do, do it for God's glory. Be Christ-like, <laughs> who glorified his Father. Be Christ-like. Do not cause, we're not to cause anyone to stumble by being a bad witness of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if it's to unbelieving Jews or unbelieving Gentiles or believing Jews and Gentiles in the church. No matter whom we're in relationship with, no matter whom we're in contact with, we're to be Christ-like. God is love. It's the law of love that governs everything. And we serve others for their benefit, not for ours. Why? That if they're an unbeliever, they might be saved from eternal death and the wrath of God. And if they're a believer, that they might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So my liberty, laying down my liberty for the benefit of someone else might be painful, quote unquote painful, but it's temporary. And compared to the gain, it's meaningless. The gain might be someone's born again of the Spirit of God and made a new creature in Christ given the power to become the child of God. Or if laid down my liberty for a Christian brother or sister, it might continue the work of God in their life 
but conforming them into the image of Jesus as at the same time as doing it to me. So laying down our Christian liberty is not an inconvenience. It's something that we get to do because it's what Jesus did. So in this race to the finish line, situation by situation, what are we to do? Always pick the option that loves the most. <laughs> Love dictates. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus is our righteousness. So pursue righteousness. Do the right thing. And the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you pursue, if we pursue righteousness and we love our neighbor as ourselves, it is the right thing. Can't miss. So all of this applies to people, right? Doesn't apply to things. The things that are loved are idols. Now, our, our life is about relationships. And the, law, the royal law is to govern those relationships. Well, what's a relationship? Uh, two willing persons, two willing volunteers engaged in each other's life. Engaged. And there's all kinds of relationships. You know, a, a broken relationship or an estranged relationship brings sorrow and pain. Amen? Yeah. A healthy relationship, on the other hand, brings happiness and, and, and meaning. But a right relationship, one that's based on Jesus Christ as the third person in the relationship, a right relationship brings joy. And John would write, greater joy I have, you know, that my children follow the Lord. Life is about relationships. And relationships take time and effort. And relationships flourish when they're governed by the royal law. And they languish and they wither when they're governed by the lo love of self. So that's all we really have in the world is relationships, right? Job's, example, uh, Job's testimony is absolutely true. Naked I came, naked I leave. Everything that we have in this world, worldly treasure, everything that we have in this world stays behind and gets burned by the Almighty God who commended His love for us that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the real treasure we have in this life and in the next is relationships. Therefore, we should invest in relationships. What do we invest? The love of God. The grace of God. Jesus Christ. We enrich other people's lives when we invest Jesus Christ into them. And live our part. We can only do our part. Live according to the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. After all, Jesus taught his guys, you know, if anyone's going to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And whosoever will lose his life shall save it. But whoso will save his life shall lose it. Lay down my will for his. Lay down my will for yours. That's how that works. And we're a church. A church is not a place. Uh, a church is not an institution. A church is a, a people. A body of people following Jesus Christ. And a church is all about relationships. So invest. <laughs> invest in the relationships here in the church. It takes time and effort. But it's worth it. After all, Church is supposed to do four things, right? Four components. Apostles' doctrine. Prayer. 
breaking of bread, communion, remembering, and fellowship. Fellowship. And that's why the Apostle Paul, in my opinion, would be inspired to write in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Well, it's either the day of my last breath, which was closer than yesterday, and 10 years ago, and 50 years ago, or it's the day when the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to the clouds. When's that? No one knows. Or it's the day of the Lord. And we got some background on that in the, in the Word. And don't we see all those things in motion? Days approaching. Relationships. The church is about relationships. And those relationships governed by the royal law. That's how we get to the finish line. In every situation, situation by situation, what should I do? Love. Love the Lord, love the other. Self is dead last. Amen? All right, if you'd stand with me, please. You know, I was just thinking, um, we have seven kids, and our oldest one, Selfish. I'll call him selfish. Then and, and still. But when Nathan and Catherine and Matthew came along, he felt like he was, he was losing out. And I told him, no, 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 no. See, what, the way this works is my love for you does not change. You don't get a lesser part of the pie. The pie grows. The Lord gives me a bigger heart. You get the same amount of love. And that seemed to comfort him. Well, I was watching Eloise on Friday afternoon because Monica has a cold. That's Monica's job, right? Watching Eloise. But she had a cold. And both my daughter and my son-in-law had two-hour meetings. And they called me on my way home from a softball game. We won both. Um, can you watch Eloise this afternoon? Sure. And she's very active. And I was down on the ground with her the entire time, just watching her and playing with her. And toward the end, I realized, you know what? I didn't get much of a chance to do this with her mom because I was working. And so I'm now doing it with Eloise. And the Lord said, love is elastic. Time is not. Don't waste the time. Good word from the Lord. So, Father, thank you for loving us. We weren't lovely. Many times we're still not lovely. As we wrestle flesh and spirit, We need help. We need help uh, subjecting our flesh to the Spirit. And so we thank you for the help that you've promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit who has come in, but also when we ask, he comes upon to give us the power from on high to do what you've commanded us to do. And you've commanded us to love, to love you preeminently and to love everybody else to serve you and to serve them rather than to serve ourselves and that runs absolutely contrary to our flesh we want to be christ-like we don't want to be like us i think i speak for myself i think i speak for all of us we want to be more like jesus and less like us please the work that you have begun and you are still working. We know you're going to finish it. We ask that you would give us the spirit to let go of those things that are hindering your work in our life.
And may we, in our hearts and in our minds, embrace this law that is to govern the race we're to win and to run well to the finish line, this law of love. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.